everyone, it's the Cantos. We hope you're enjoying this beautiful weather. And make sure to be safe and stay healthy. So get out there and have some fun. We miss you Thanks. and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hi everybody, we miss you. Um, this is our crazy dog. She likes to be quarantined with us. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Love you guys. Hey guys, love you, miss you. Hope to see you all soon. Take care, stay safe. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church Freehold. We are so glad that you could join us this morning. On a personal level, I am so glad that I could finally see my hairstylist. But yes, like everyone else, I am shallow too. So not many announcements. We're still looking for pictures and videos. So if you would like to read some scripture or some of the liturgy, please send me an email. If you would like to participate in the passing of the peace, please take those videos and send them to Christy or to me, or we can schedule a time and uh, I can record you over Zoom. So all of that's out there. We would love to hear from you and see you. A reminder that we will have a congregational meeting on July 12th at 1130. We're going to do this over Zoom. I had hoped to have a, a newsletter out this week with some more detailed instructions, but that's going to have to wait until next week. So please forgive me on that. Also, we will be worshiping in person on July 19th at 10 o'clock, as we usually do. And we will be meeting in the empty lot next to the Christian Ed building. So if you are available and able and willing to balance risk and relationship and come out and join us, we would love to see you. Please remember to wear a mask. And also, please remember to bring your own lawn chair or beach chair or whatever you would like so that we can spread out in a socially distant and responsible manner and worship together. So... We're really looking forward to that. I know I'm really looking forward to that. But if you can't make it out, we will still put together a video service so that you can see, so that you can worship online. So uh, it will not be a live video of the service itself. We, we just don't have that kind of reliable internet connection that far from the building and we'll probably put together a better product. We'll definitely put together a better product recording it online. So that's what's up. Please join us for hymn number 804, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Rejoice, rejoice. 
Please join us in the prayer of invocation. Eternal God, you have called us to be members of one body. Join us with those who in all times and places have praised your name, that with one heart and mind we may show the unity of your church and bring honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please hear the call to confession. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As God has instructed us in these great commandments, and because we have not lived in full obedience, let us now confess our sins to God trusting Christ as our Savior and Lord. Gracious God, we believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. Yet we confess that we do not always live up to our beliefs. We do not live into the unity of the church as Christ has called us to be one body. We see separation and hatred between your children, O God, Yet we do not do enough to mend the breaches. Help us, God, to love one another and practice community with all of your children. Help us, God, to be agents of unity in the church and in the world that you have created. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Now, beloved, as we have been reconciled to God, let us also be reconciled to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And say also with you. Also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. 
and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We have a minute for mission from Berwyn and Peggy Gatormson. Good morning to everyone. And um, we have been, um, Peggy and I have been lifelong Presbyterians. We, uh, we actually met uh, at Youth Fellowship many, many, many years ago. Um, so this is not our, uh, uh, our first Presbyterian church. It's actually our fourth. But we've been here for 15 years and uh, it, it's been good for us. Um, during that time, uh, I've been an elder uh, working on worship and property commission. Uh, I was um, a member of the pastoral nominating committee, currently a member of the choir as well, and do lay, lay leadership for our worship services. Uh, Peggy is currently serving as a deacon and an usher. She was an elder and member of the worship commission, uh, attends adult Sunday school, and um, is a past member of the nominating commission, and, uh, and is a current member of the property commission as well. <clears throat> so we do some things together. We both participate in our Wednesday night koinonia, we're members of Sandra's green team, helping to maintain the plantings around the church building. And uh, we're both in the Unity Club. Uh, now, Peggy will say a few words about what church means to her. Well, to me, the church is a place where I can connect the spirit within me with the spirit within other members. It's a safe place to share inner struggles and great joys. What great things God has brought in our lives. The church is a lifeline between God and the people. The people are the church, but they need a place to gather, lift each other and share God's love. Please carefully and prayerfully consider making a generous pledge to the church. The church will always be our first and most important charitable giving. So we are blessed to be a part of this congregation. We, uh, we ask that you join us as we strive to be a blessing to others. Please join us in the prayer for illumination. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you in a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. What a powerful story that is. Our reading this morning from the book of Acts speaks into our fractured and chaotic world. I love that image of Paul and Silas sitting in prison in chains singing hymns. It reminds me of a story my mom told me a number of years ago about a man from our church. His name was Abe Abernathy, and he sang in the choir with my mother. Abe was probably old enough to be my grandfather, and he was a real gentleman. He was a doctor, a pathologist, and for many years, he served as the deputy county coroner for Washington County, Pennsylvania. That meant that Abe performed a lot of autopsies on people who had been murdered. One time, my mother asked him, how do you get through the difficult cases? How do you deal with an autopsy on a child? Abe's answer was simple. I sing. He told my mother that he would sing hymns or even opera. This allowed him to focus on his task without being overcome by grief or wondering what course that child's life might have taken. Music was enough to distract his emotional response so that he could perform his duties. As a coroner, he had to be precise and emotionally detached. He could be called as a witness in a trial. Paul and Silas sang hymns while they were in prison. Abe Abernathy sang hymns while he performed autopsies. Those are powerful stories. So let's take a closer look at why Paul and Silas were in jail in the first place. Paul and Silas were in Philippi, which was a Roman colony in Macedonia. They were there to evangelize, to establish a new worshiping community, a new congregation. They were outsiders. They were Jews. Remember, at that point, no one was using the name Christian. Nobody outside of the Jewish community would have recognized the difference between the two groups. Paul and Silas are going to a place for prayer when they're followed by a slave girl who is afflicted with a spirit of divination, who shouts out, these men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now, let's be clear. This is not the Holy Spirit that is speaking. The Spirit is probably associated with the Greek god Apollo. I don't know if I would call this spirit a demon, but much like the demons that Jesus casts out, this spirit knows the truth. Paul and Silas serve the one true God. Even though this spirit is correct, 
not the witness that Paul and Silas want or need. They are in Philippi to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. They're not there to say, yeah, it's okay to listen to other spirits, just remember the truth that Jesus is Lord. To Paul, in particular, it doesn't matter that this spirit spoke the truth. It was the wrong witness, and it had to be cast out. But that spirit made the slave girl very valuable to her owners. Her owners could sell the girl's services to anyone who could pay. They were exploiting the fact that she was possessed by a spirit. They profited from her affliction. Paul took away their source of income. The owners had Paul and Silas arrested and beaten. They incited a mob. They labeled Paul and Silas as outsiders. They painted them as enemies because they were Jews. They hauled them before a magistrate and had them thrown in jail so that they could be held for trial. The owners of the slave girl knew that Paul and Silas carried a message that was a threat to the established order, an order in which slavery and exploitation were encouraged and rewarded. It didn't matter that Paul and Silas were right. Most of the people in Philippi wanted to maintain the status quo. During the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, many white community leaders in the South, politicians, sheriffs, business leaders, and even clergy, sought to downplay the causes of the civil rights movement. They claimed, falsely, that African Americans in their communities weren't that interested in civil rights in equal accommodation in stores, restaurants, and public transportation. These white community leaders said that African Americans in their communities weren't all that interested in the right to vote. Things were fine just as they were. When civil rights leaders organized marches and sit-ins and all sorts of nonviolent protests, white community leaders denounced those demonstrations. They said the protests were the work of a handful of outside agitators who wanted to destroy their way of life. Sounds kind of like the charges against Paul and Silas. These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt serve. The white people in positions of privilege in, Amer in the American South in the 1950s and 60s were unwilling to admit that black people in their communities wanted change, wanted to be treated as full citizens, wanted to be treated as equals. Those voices are still with us today. There are lots of people in our society who want to ignore the calls for change, the calls for social justice. Some people will tell you that there is no racism in our society. We don't have a problem with race in this country. Yeah, some people actually say that. But I do see signs of hope. I see more white people paying attention to the cries of black and brown people listening to the songs of lament. The people who arrested Paul and Silas didn't understand two things, two central truths. First, Jesus Christ is Lord and the message of salvation is true. Second, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. The authorities were not allowed to treat them as they did. Perhaps it was easier for Paul and Silas to sit in prison and sing hymns because they knew that they were right. 
They knew the truth of Jesus Christ, and they knew that the Roman authorities couldn't hold them. And maybe the singing distracted them from their pain and discomfort, much as singing helped my old friend Abe Abernathy get through difficult medical examinations. What's more, because Paul and Silas know that their case is righteous, they sit in chains as witnesses to God's love and justice. And when the earthquake happens, they don't exploit the situation. They remain in their place. If they had fled, the jailer, who was otherwise innocent, would have been executed for letting the prisoners go. Paul and Silas were powerful witnesses. Perhaps their faithfulness inspired the other prisoners to remain in the jail. Certainly their faithfulness inspired the jailer to convert to this new religion. And we know that Paul and Silas succeeded in establishing a new congregation at Philippi. We know this because Paul later writes a letter to that congregation, the Philippians. We have to read this story as history and as a parable. Remember, in a parable, we have to read ourselves into every part in the story. I'm sure we all want to see ourselves as Paul and Silas, but maybe we should spend more time with this story as the other prisoners in the jail, or even as the jailer. We're all imprisoned by racism, even if we, as individuals, don't practice the worst parts of racism. We are held in its chains because the presence of racism, racism on the individual and on the systemic level, limits our ability to practice relationship with people who look different from us. And that limits us as witnesses to God's love for the world. It limits us as we attempt to do the work of building God's kingdom. There's a line from the movie, The Usual Suspects, that I love. One of the characters says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Racism is like that too. We want to pretend it doesn't exist. We want to pretend we don't have to work to dismantle it. We want excuses that let us off the hook. We want an earthquake to set us free when what we actually need to do is work together to cast off our chains. This is uncomfortable territory for a lot of us, including me. Yet I feel hopeful. It really seems like more of us are getting on board with the work of reconciliation. As I've said before, part of that work is getting educated. Like the other prisoners in that jail with Paul and Silas, we have to listen to the hymns, the cries, and the laments of our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to seek out the voices of today's civil rights leaders. Rather than complaining that there isn't another Martin Luther King Jr. in this day, rather than waiting for the media to anoint one particular leader, instead of waiting for that leader to emerge, go out and research the leaders who already exist. We can do this, it's our job. And they're out there. I've mentioned some of them before, like the Reverend William Barber II or the Reverend Otis Moss III. Google them, find their sermons online and listen to them. Some of their messages may be challenging or even painful. Listen anyhow. We have to stop waiting for this to come to us. We have to do our homework. 
These are the first steps in the long road to reconciliation. These are the steps we need to take if we are to be effective witnesses in today's world. Will you walk down that road with me? Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join us in hymn number 821, How Can I Keep From Singing? As the Lord has been good and faithful to us, let us with joy and thanksgiving return that goodness unto the Lord. Please remember to send in your offering by mail if you can or online. We have links for donations. Please remember that we need your financial support, especially in these challenging times. Thank you. We give our thanks through our talents, our time, and our treasure. Thanks be to God whose love creates us. Thanks be to God whose mercy redeems us. Thanks be to God whose grace leads us into the future. Amen. Now we come to that time in service where we lift up the people in our congregation, in our community, and the world around us. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, awaken us from our slumber. Break us out of our self-imposed prisons. Free us from self-absorption, pettiness, narrow-mindedness, ignorance, and racism. Help us to see and hear those whose struggles are greater than ours. 
O God of every nation, race, and land, help us to see the world outside of our walls. Break us out of our self-imposed prisons. Send your spirit so that we may love all your children as we love ourselves. This is our prayer. We also offer continued prayers for Trina Parks and for all of our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ whose faith has been tested during these times. We lift up a lot of people in our community who are in need of healing. We lift up those people in our community who are in need of healing. Beth Pajak, who is waiting on results of a lung biopsy and is fighting breast cancer. Judy Cavicchio, who is struggling with severe asthma and COPD. Liz Kelly, who is recovering from foot surgery. Susan Croft, who is having stomach problems. Sue Craig, who is recovering from cataract surgery. Bev Dame, who is dealing with cancer. Susan Beaton and Linda Schmidt, as they continue their recovery. Eileen Goldkoff, who is recovering from hip surgery. Lynn Gatormson, who is recovering from elbow surgery. We also lift up Alexa, Sophie, Betty and Karen and Kathy, and everyone who is struggling with illness and disease. We lift up those who are grieving, Michelle Bianco, Christine and Myla, Trina. We lift up the children of our congregation and churches everywhere. We lift up our Sunday school teachers and we ask that more people are able to feel the call to service and serve as Sunday school teachers. I lift up my friend Susan who is struggling taking care of her elderly mother who is in the early to middle stages of dementia. We lift up Susan and every other parent who is now a parent to their mother or father who is overwhelmed with being caregiver and child at the same time. We lift up Adam and Tamara, two refugees from Afghanistan who have lost loved ones back in Afghanistan and cannot be with their families. As always, we offer a prayer of thanksgiving and prayers for health and safety for all of the helpers out there. We lift up all the nurses, doctors, lab techs, nurses, aides, housekeeping staff, and first responders who are on the front lines of this pandemic. We give thanks for all they do, and we pray that God continue to watch over them in this time. Finally, as cities and states emerge from this time of quarantine, we ask for guidance and wisdom from the Holy Spirit for all our leaders as they make difficult decisions about how and when to reopen businesses, schools, and houses of worship. And we pray for wisdom and grace for all of us as we navigate the return to parts of our old routines. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Make me a channel of your peace Where there is hatred, let me bring your Where there is injury, your heart and Lord. 
and livest our true faith in you. O Master, grant that I may never see so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Please join us in hymn number 792, There is a Balm in Gilead. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Now, beloved, as you go forth into the world, remember that we are called to cast off the chains that keep us from being in relationship with all of God's beloved children. So go forth and be instruments of God's peace and love and reconciliation. Do not return evil for evil to any person, but know that we are all loved by God and that we are called to reflect that love to everyone we meet. Go forth and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, let all God's children say, Amen.